Welcome to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information, visit us at compasslu.org. All right. God's love, grace, blessings, and mercy to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm very thankful to be with you all this morning and be able to share with you about kingdom love. Something that's very exciting about kingdom love or love in general, love is what energizes everything. It's the key. It's the key to the kingdom of God. So love is the key. So let's please turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. So one way our Heavenly Father defines Himself is love. When we love people the way He does, the way the Lord Jesus Christ showed us in his life when he was here, we transform the world and people around us. So 1 John chapter 4, and I'll be reading from the ESV, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not what? Doesn't know God. Why? Because God is love, right? So if we are we know our Heavenly Father and we imitate Him, then we're going to manifest love. But if we're not loving others, we truly don't understand our God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love it just seems that plainly i love that (laughs) i'm glad he tells us who he is in this the love of god was manifest among us that he sent his son his only son into the world that we might live through him well that's what we want to do right we want to live we want to enjoy this life not just survive not just get by But when we know our Heavenly Father and we see what He has available for us and we are living love, we truly live. It's a life worth living. Verse 10, In this, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. And that's talking about motive. That gets into motive, our motive of life. We love because He first loved us. And send his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides or dwells or lives or remains in us. And his love is perfected in us. And this word perfected means brought to full maturity, full um, experiential knowledge amongst ourselves and others. It gets back to um, uh, that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is love. And when we live love, we're living the way he wants us to, and we are bringing that kingdom reality into a microcosm of our own lives by doing such a thing. Now, this word propitiation is not a common word that we use uh, in every day. I mean, I probably rarely bring it up even in a month, unless I'm talking about the word, right? <laughs> so uh, propitiation is the act of gaining or regaining, regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. So Jesus Christ traded his life, his sinless life, for ours. And we understand that sin, the wages are death. So he paid all those wages for us by accomplishing God's will in his day and time for fulfilling the law. And by doing this, he paid it all for you and I so we don't have that to deal with. The sin problem has been dealt with. Now, several versions render propitiation as sacrifice, and you may even have that in some of the Bibles that you're reading right now. Jesus was the ultimate payment for you and me. Now, it seems that sometimes when we think about the word sacrifice, um, people think about it perhaps as what you have to give up. Uh, In baseball, 
someone may give up the opportunity to score by being a sacrificial runner. They do something that causes the attention to be drawn to them while their teammate scores. So he gave up his ability to do X, Y, Z. It's interesting, the Bible addresses sacrifice very early on, and it gives us an example of two brothers that had uh, brought some sacrifice. So let's go to Genesis chapter 4, please. This is the first record that we can read in the canon of Scripture that talks about sacrifice. So Genesis chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and that word knew, it means to know her in a way that they would conceive a child. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Now, I would imagine it, it would be tempting to think that God is a respecter of persons because one brought a living thing and someone else brought what he had from the ground. But if we look at some of the terminology in here, it um, starts to shed some light on what we're looking at here. So as we go back, uh, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought forth an offering from the fruit of the ground. It just says he bought that. Well, what does it say about Abel? He brought the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. Now, firstborn, from a biblical sense, those that are firstborn are set aside for God. And we can even see that with Samuel. When he was born, he was set aside for the Lord's service. So they were considered sacred. So it doesn't say anything about Cain bringing the chiefest, best thing that he could bring. It just says he brought. And it says over the course of time. So how many times did he do this? I don't know. How many times did they bring vegetables or bring, you know, the animals? It doesn't say. But one thing it doesn't say about Cain, he bought the, brought the very best he could possibly offer. But it doesn't say that about what Cain had to offer. So then, uh, we read on in verse 5, But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Why? It makes you question why. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? Okay, let me ask you this. Is God, does he know everything? Yeah. He does, he knows. He knows exactly the situation, but he gives Cain a chance to render up some, you know, dialogue here. Then God says to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Okay, so apparently what he was doing was not well. God is being loving and pointing out, hey, the thing that thou doest is not good. The way you're going or what you're doing, you might want to think about that. And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door. It's a desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So, he's saying, look, here's the problem. Here's what you got to do. He gives them a way to escape, a way to fix it. And as we know, it got even worse for that situation. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, it gives us a little bit more insight into this. Hebrews 11, and we'll read in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, he died. He still speaks. Though he died, he still speaks. 
So one thing this tells us is that the righteous things that we do, the things that we do in love, endure forever. How long ago did Cain and Abel live? A long, long time ago. Yet God still remembers the things that Cain did. Same thing is true for us, or the same the things that Abel did. The things that Abel did. We also remember what Cain did, which was no bueno. <laughs> but the good is still brought up. How about for us? Perhaps when they open the book of life and read the good things that you did and love in your life. That'll be a great day, right? God is not unrighteous to fit, forget our work of believing and labor of love. The thing we have to re realize here is that God is the searcher of hearts. He's not after grudging obedience, but that which comes from the heart. And that is the case with Cain and Abel. Cain was looking at it as what he had to give up. Abel saw it as, man, what can I give? That's my sacrifice. I want to give the best to my God because I love him. That's you and I. That's what we do. We think about, you know, our sacrifices we make in life. It's not what we have to give up, you know, a Saturday night or whatever it is, a Sunday morning or, or things throughout the week that we do. It's what can we give? It's our motive of heart. And God is the searcher of hearts and he rewards us for those good things. <laughs> it has to go back to motive, like I said. Let's go to 1 John again for chapter 4. 1 John has a lot about loving and loving God. 1 John 4 and verse 19. This boils it down. This could be the verse of the day. We could say this verse and say amen and go to the house. It could, it's, a, it's a really short verse and you could even retain it like that fast. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first... Let's all say it together. We love... Because he first loved us. Man, that's simple, right? That's our motive. It just boils it all down. We love others because God loved us. And it makes it easier to do. Because we think about all the things that God loves us through, perhaps the challenges that we face in our lives, the, 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 the petty sins that we stumble over perhaps daily. Maybe not you. But I know that for me, there's things that I still have to deal with in life. You know what I mean? But God loves me through all that. If he can love me through all the stuff that I do and things that I mess up, I can certainly love others. It makes it easy to do. So if the kingdom of God is a kingdom of love, because God is love, it makes that's why we want to be imitators of him. So as we imitate him, we imitate a walk of love and a life of love. So what does this look like in a practical sense? Well, let's read that verse first in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and we'll read verses 1 and 2. Just so you know, I'm not joshing about being an imitator of God. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in what? Love. Love. Walk in love. Okay, so that's what God does. That's what we do. As Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, love is all about, God is all about love. Jesus Christ, who came to show us the Father, lived love. He showed us the way to walk in our day and time. All kinds of little lessons and parables and teachings and actions and loving the unlovable, hugging and touching the untouchable. Dealing with the sin problem so that you and I don't have to do it. He showed us the way. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'm sure you all probably already know that one. It's talking about sacrifice again. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. <laughs> That's how we live. 
We live love. And that sacrifice, we don't have to go through and experience the same thing that our Lord did. He already did. He paid that price once and for all. He was the ultimate Passover lamb, and by his blood, all of us are clean. Therefore, we don't have to go down that road and drink the cup of wrath that he drank. What you and I can do is be living sacrifices, putting ourselves out there for one another, loving one another, being there in challenging situations, whatever the need is, whatever it looks like, that's what we do. This is the practical application of worship. Singing in worship, that's one way to worship. Another way to worship is to live love. Your life becomes worship when we live love. That's the kingdom being brought into present day reality for you and I. Wherever we go, wherever we live love, it's an example of what the kingdom will be in the future. Let's look at Luke chapter 10. Our Lord spent a lot of time showing and teaching us what it looks like. He broke down a lot of man-made religious barriers to show us what living love looks like in a practical manner. So Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life, eternal life? And he said unto him, Now see, that's the thing I really love about Jesus. There are times when people would ask him questions, and man, he would just lay out the word for him, the truth, or teach him something, he would tell him. But he was also really masterful at you know, understanding somebody's motive. And if they were coming at him to try and bait him or trick him or do something, he would answer their questions with a question. <laughs> and I love that. And, and, and sometimes in witnessing, when you're, when you're talking to people, you can see, you know, does this person really want to know what I have to say or are they just trying to, like, goad me down this path and then, you know, try and get me in the end? So... Just do what the Lord did. It makes it simple. Just ask them a question. Well, what do you think about that? Then you get to see where they're coming from. <laughs> he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So he gave him the chance to speak. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So he asked it. The guy already knew the answer to the question, obviously. <laughs> Why did he ask Jesus? You know what I mean? And he said, all right, well, that's a great answer. Do that, and you'll live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Oh, that's a good question, right? <laughs> So Jesus replied, and he replies over the question. It's, it's long because he tells this parable first, and then he gets to the question in the end. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, that's a dangerous thing to do. There was lots of hidden rocks. It was a windy path, and robbers and thieves would hang out and accost travelers, especially if they were coming from Jerusalem going towards Jericho or headed towards Samaria into that land. It's just not good. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, the priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So here's the religious leader of that time. He's a guy that probably spoke to the congregation. He may have even seen this guy in the crowd sometime. He saw him. I'm going over here. He walked away from that scenario. Verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. So here's another guy that's in the religious order. He may not have been a leader uh, that was up in the front teaching everything, but he was following example, the first guy. That guy walked by. I think I'm going to do the same thing, just go around this cat. But a Samaritan. Now, this, the audience that he was speaking to might have, you know, 
cringe a little bit because Samaritan, you know, they, they didn't have respect for these people. They were uh, what they viewed as half-breeds, you know, all the all the children of Israel that, you know, got carried away onto Babylon and this place and everything, and they all kept their pure genetic lines and blah, 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 but those Samaritans mixed with the locals and blah, 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 you know, they're not pure. <laughs> you know, so they didn't have a good relationship with these people. They kind of looked down on them, you know. It's, in our day and time, we would call that racism. So this Samaritans and the people, oh, he said Samaritan, oh, gosh. <laughs> As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion. How many times we see that with Jesus when he was moved with compassion and he did something. He fed the people, he fed the masses, or he ministered to them, or uh, stopped on one trip to take care of a woman that had touched him and healed her and then went on and raised a little girl from the dead. The Lord was moved with compassion. This guy was too. And he went to him. And he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Now you might be thinking, why would you do that? You know, right? <laughs> the dude is messed up and you're going to pour this stuff on him? Well, let's think about that. Uh, what happens when our little kid, they scrape their knee? All right, you go get you a little bit of alcohol, you know, and you might clean that off. <laughs> Blowing as hot as all it burns. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, whatever you do, my kisses on there. And then... So you put alcohol, the wine was used as a cleansing agent. Then he put oil on there. What do you do after you get that off there? You put a little triple antibiotic on there, some boo-boo cream, right? And then you dress it up, you know, it's all good to go. So this guy, he was prepared on this trip. He's coming along, he's got his own little first aid kit. He puts a little wine on there, he gets his stuff cleaned up. He puts some ointment on there, he dresses his wounds. pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So, you know, he just make the guy, all right, are you good enough to walk? I'm going to ride on my donkey here while you are in tow. No, he took him on there, his own beast, and he took care of him. So he ministered to him further when he was at that inn. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So here he gets to the question, right? And the guy's like, oh, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. <laughs> Ah, uh, you want to live? You want to have eternal life? Live love. That's what he's saying. I'd like to bring this parable a little bit into modern times for us and thinking about this thing and what it represents figuratively. That guy that was accosted and broken down on the side of the road and beat up, that's the people of the world. They've been tore up by the adversary. They've been treated bad. They find themselves in different challenging scenarios, whatever that may be. That's the people of the world. Along comes this traveler. You could think about that person as Jesus Christ. Or you could think about that person as someone who's born again, live in love. And they take care of that person. And they take him to the inn, which is us here at Compass, here and other places, other churches. They take him to the church. And he says, whatever you spend in your life taking care of this person, however you put yourself out, when I return, I will repay. That's the rewards of the future. Anything that we do for God in love in this day and time is going to be repaid for all of eternity. Does that sound A, no bueno, or B, very good? <laughs> very good, right? Yeah, that's a trick question. All right. So um, let's go to Mark chapter 12. So loving service. Love has to be done with the right, I mean, doing this service has to be done with the right motives. And we'll see a glimpse 
of the kingdom of God when we live this way. So Mark chapter 12 and verse 28. And this is a, this is a similar record, but not exactly the same. And you'll see how it unfolds. And one of the scribes came up, to, came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus what? He answered it. He answered the guy. He didn't ask him a question, did he? He answered this question because he recognized the motive of this man's heart in this particular scenario. Answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's known as the Shema or Shema. And they still say it today. Some of the mezuzahs that you see on the doors, like when you come into this synagogue, there's a little thing that's got a prayer in there. A lot of them have that very same thing inside that all rolled up. If you were to open it up and read it, and if you could read Hebrew, part of it is the Shema. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, one God. There is none other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than the whole of burnt offerings and sacrifices. Those things are important at day at day and time, but that was just an act. Living the word and living love is so much more important than just doing works. Works for works sake only gives you a reward in this day and time. But whatever you do for God in love and helping out your neighbor and whatever the situation is, that yields reward for all eternity. That's what we do. That's how we live. That's our motive. God loved us, so we love one another. And whatever that takes, whatever that means, whatever that looks like, if it's taking care of the people that are broken down in this world for whatever's happened to them, they've been accosted by the adversary or by the devil, we're in there. If it means running over to help your house, your friend's house because you had a big windstorm and it peeled back his roof and you go over there and help him and you do it with the right motive, rewards for all eternity. It's not necessarily just giving money. Sometimes it is that. But sometimes it's what you do. It's taking a meal to someone who just had a baby. Someone is maybe having a challenging in life or whatever, and you go and you help them out, you clean their house. Whatever it is you're doing to help out one another, even if it's a stranger, even if it's a stranger, the point of that parable about the good Samaritan, the neighbor, who is the neighbor? The neighbor is the person that you're near. It's not your physical landlocked neighbor next to your house. It's whoever you're near. That's your neighbor. Right now, it's whoever you're sitting next to in this church. <laughs> Other times, it's who you're next to in the grocery or driving down the road or whatever it may be. Whoever has a need, that's your neighbor, and we love them. Oh, see, you're right, teacher. You've said is more than the whole of burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, what does Jesus say when he hears that guy say that? And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said unto him, You are not far from where? The kingdom of God. Oh, man, is that not powerful? When we live love, we bring the kingdom into reality in our day and time. We don't get to experience it all the time. Obviously, we get flat tires. We have shingles blow off our roof. We have people that are ugly to us at times and things that you face just complicated. 
you know, even with the best job that you have, you got the best job, I love my job. Sometimes there's challenging things that happen with your job, right? It's the way it is. Won't be like that in the future in full kingdom. But when you and I are living love, we're bringing that stuff into tangible reality. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 tells us that all, of all the things that will end in the future, love is not one of them. <laughs> you know why? Is God, God is eternal, right? God's eternal. God is love. Therefore, axiomatically, or as Will likes to say, mathematically, <laughs> things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other, Euclid's theorem, if God is eternal, love is eternal. It never ends, because that's who he is, and we get to imitate that. I love that. Let's go to Luke 15, and uh, we're going to close in this record. And for you guys that are looking at this in the future, and you'll see the little uh, charts or whatever, I have to apologize. My dyslexia got the best of me. It'll say Luke 11, 15. I messed it up. It should be Luke 15, 11. All right, so... Go ahead and get my penance out right now. Right. So Luke 15. Now, this record here is pretty cool. Charles Dickens said that this was the greatest short story ever written. That's really something when we consider this record about the forgiving father. Now, we see a lot of records in the word about sons. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Joseph and the rest of his brothers and all that scenario. And sometimes these brothers can be applied allegorically to present life. Uh, in this time when Jesus is laying out and unpacking this record, these two brothers represent the whole of society. And I want you to think about that as we go through this. One brother represents the Gentile nations. The other brother represents the children of Israel, the Judean nations, those, all that. So let's consider that as we go through this. Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. Okay, well, that's not, not a good thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> Even in that day and time, that was no a good thing. So give me. Uh, it's an improper request. The share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, which would have been one third of what his father owned. The older son, because he was firstborn, would have gotten a two, uh, a double portion of whatever any other son would get. So he had two sons. It would have been divided in thirds. The younger son gets a third. And he took all the all that he had. And journeyed into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as one of the citizens of that country, who sent him in the fields to feed pigs. <laughs> I laugh because the audience that Jesus would have been talking to, they, they thought pigs were disgusting. They didn't eat them. They didn't touch them. They didn't raise them. They didn't do anything with them. So for this guy to have to go feed pigs, they'd have been like, oh, no, that's terrible. <laughs> and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So all the people he'd been partying, yucking it up with, were gone. And no one, get, no one was treating him like a neighbor. And he was reduced to eating the same thing that the pigs were. There's a Jewish proverb today. When Israel is brought to the carob seed or the carob pod, they remember their God. They were feeding them carob seeds or carob pods. That was the hog feed. But when he came to himself, he said, when he came to himself, it's like he came to his right mind. He was out of his right mind, doing whatever he was supposed to be, doing whatever he was doing there. When he came to his right mind to turn to the truth or turn towards God or turn towards anything is turning towards sanity. Riotous living, not the best state of mind. 
And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he did it anyway. He went and did this, and now he's been brought low. He's going to go and talk to his dad. I've sinned against heaven and before you. He knew what he did was wrong to his dad. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me, the ESV says, but it's make me. Before he said, give me. Now he's saying, make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Man, it just makes me think that in this particular scenario, that father had to be looking for that. And he said he saw him a great way off, and he probably wouldn't recognize him. He left all gussied up and had all this stuff with him, and he comes back a filthy beggar dressed in rags, you know, broken down, emaciated. He was said he was starving, so he did, probably didn't even look the same, you know. But his father was watching for him, and he saw him afar off, and it says he ran to him. In this culture, people that were well-to-do did not run. But he broke with culture, he broke with tradition, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. And where it says kissed him, if you look at that in the Hebrew, he kissed him many times. I could imagine, you know, you think about that, maybe a scenario where that happens and you would fall on your son, you'd just be so thankful for him to be back, you know, and you're not reading him the riot act, you're just thankful that he's there and kiss him many kisses and you're hugging him and you're thankful for the fact that he made it back alive. And he said to his father, or he said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. He's getting ready to run into his whole glockenspiel. Of, we know what he had free hearse. I'm, Dad, I got this stuff I got to say to you. And I am no longer to be called thy son. But the father said, he interrupted him. He said to his servants, they must have ran after him. Why is the master running? And they followed him out there. And he tells him, you, go get the best coat. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And as we go through this, I'm just going to unpack it as we go So, because I'm getting short on time here. Being the best robe. Think about this in our day and time, being clothed with the gift of Holy Spirit. Let's think about that as we go. And put on him, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand. And that hand, that ring would have been the family signet ring. And we would have given that boy... He took everything he had with him before, so he didn't have it. So the father must have been ready for him to come back, and he put a signet ring on his finger, and it gave him all the power and authority of that family. When you and I gift the gift of the Holy Spirit, we have the power and authority to operate that gift. And shoes on his feet. Servants didn't wear shoes. So to put them there, he's received fully back into the family with nothing held back. You are back to being a member of this family. And bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This parable is the third in a series of things that were lost. There was the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And all these records... The thing that was lost was not aware of the anguish of the searcher looking for that. And when it returned, all three of those instances, there was rejoicing. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. Well, that's where the party was. Where? In the house. Well, think about now. Where do we want to be? In the household of God, right? In the Father's house. He heard music and dancing, and he ran where he didn't to see what was happening. No. And he called one of his servants and accosted him, or he asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And his brother was like, Woo! <laughs> nope. All right. But he was angry 
and he refused to go in, go in the house. That's the place to be. That's where the father was. That's where his brother was. That's where the party was. That's where all the blessings were happening. His father came out. Do you see the love? The father goes out to the son that was lost, and he goes out to the son that was still with him and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. <laughs> is that true? I don't know. Does every son do everything that his father wants him to do? No, he's being a little exaggerated here, huh? Uh, disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this, your son, the son of yours came, right? He's not saying, say, my brother comes back, right? No, this, your son, he puts it on his dad. Who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son. And when you see that in the in the Greek, it's my beloved and endeared child. He's reaching out to him, just like he reached out to his other son. You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So this summarizes, summarizes all of society. Judean, Gentile, the ones that stayed, the one that left, the one that was trying to do its best to be self-righteous and fell short, was angry, and the other one that realized, hey, it's better to be with my father, with our heavenly father. He decided to go back. You say, okay, well, if this is a summary of our day and time, well, and the house represents the household of God because that's what there are today, Judean, Gentile, and church of God. Where's Jesus? Jesus is represented in this parable by the love of the Father. He extended to both. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him shall not what? Perish, Perish but have everlasting life. You and I have the privilege of reaching out like that forgiving father, like the good Samaritan. You and I, when we go into this world, we are reaching out with God's love and calling people back to what is available. The place to be is in the household of God, is to be with God and in relationship with Him, to have that enjoyment with all of us, right? That's where we want to be. So as we do these things, as we love, we heal give a message on Sunday, a tongues of interpretation or prophecy, whatever we're doing in love, bringing into the supernatural, into tangible reality, or just loving by gifts of service or acts of service to one another, we show the kingdom of God in love to all that we come in contact with. So Heavenly Father, we truly do love you and are thankful for what you've given us for this great life that we get to live and the blessings that we have, the forgiveness that we have, that we can leave all of our baggage and dirty laundry at the door and come in and rejoice with you and your household. Thank you for keeping your hedge of protection around all these people and for the people that we're going to come to in contact with in the future, how we can reach out with your love to embrace them, to love the unlovable, to hug the unhuggable or whatever that needs to be done at that time that we can show you to the world so that when they see us, they can see an example of what it is to live love and to be with you. We thank you for all these things and we praise you for your greatness and your goodness and your heart and your mercy and forgiveness. And we say all these things, Father, in the name of your tremendous Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Compass Christian Church Weekly Sermon Podcast. For more information on how we are striving to follow Jesus together here in Louisville, Kentucky, check out our website, compasslu.org, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and view additional resources.